PETA declares victory for the animals as Canada Goose has stated an end to using fur. Now what about the feathers? That's next on The PETA Podcast. Welcome to The PETA Podcast. I'm Emil Guillermo, your host for this inside look at animal rights, brought to you by PETA, the largest animal rights organization in the world. On today's episode, after years of protest by PETA and its team of activists, Canada Goose, the outerwear retailer, has announced it's going fur-free. That means the fur trim, which has been a cruel decorative tool to fashion, taken from real animals who've suffered, no more. It all comes after a multi-year campaign, where PETA has used billboards to get the message out. It's become a shareholder to wage the fight at the corporate level, and it's supported the action of leaders on the ground, waging demonstrations and protests that let people know the animals have a voice. Celebrities, too, have used their fame to help the animals. Celebrities like Pamela Anderson, Bill Maher, Morrissey, Justin Long, Maggie Q, and many more. Ken DeGoose fought back with their own ads, but the company couldn't undo the images of how coyotes are trapped for their fur to be placed on Canada Goose jackets. The coats were Exhibit A of cruelty and abuse. When PETA filed a Federal Trade Commission complaint, Canada Goose couldn't keep assuring consumers that animal abuse wasn't part of Canada Goose fashion. And so Canada Goose said it won't use fur and has joined a growing list of top fashion outlets that have done the same. Given that, PETA has announced a moratorium on protests against Canada Goose, hoping that the company will take the next step and ban its use of all animal products, principally goose down, the feathers that insulate Canada Goose outerwear. We thought it'd be a good idea to reprise my conversation with Ann Brainerd, PETA Senior Director of Corporate Responsibility, the key negotiator with Canada Goose. In this conversation from December 2019, as PETA mounted another year exposing the cruelty of Canada Goose products, Brainerd talks about the fur, the feathers, and the importance of being feather-free. You'll hear why PETA takes the protest seriously, and you'll gain insight into how Canada Goose has slowly approached becoming a more ethical company. So even if the company has gone fur-free and PETA has a moratorium on protests, Canada Goose needs to go further, faster. My conversation with PETA's Senior Director of Corporate Responsibility, Ann Brainerd, on the PETA Podcast. So, Ann, tell me about Canada Goose. Why is Canada Goose the target again this year? Didn't they do well last year? (laughs) No, they did not do well last year. They haven't done well since their inception over 50 years ago. Um, they are an outerwear company out of Toronto. Uh, they sell jackets that are trimmed in coyote fur. Um, and these are coyotes who are caught and trapped in the wild. Um, they suffer in traps that mangle their limbs and immobilize them for days. Uh, they also stuff their jackets with down feathers, which come from birds who have suffered terrifying and painful deaths. Well, describe some of that. I mean, describe the fur. How do the animals trap? And what caught PETA's attention about the way the Canada Goose trapped animals for the fur trim? Sure. Well, Canada Goose has what they call sourcing standards. Um, But this still allows trappers to use deal traps, which are traps designed to crush their limbs. and are actually so inhumane that many countries have actually banned them outright. So why did they still do it? I mean, PETA (laughs) exposed that last year. What happened? Well, whenever animals are viewed as commodities, corners will always be cut. And in this case, when you're trapping a coyote in the wild, there's really no other way to do it than to use a trap. And you have to imagine a deep wilderness where they lay out these traps and the trappers are not checking the traps frequently. So animals, after they are entangled by the traps, 
it might take multiple days for the trappers to get back to return to the animals before they bludgeon them to death or the animals, you know, sometimes succumb just to the elements or perhaps attacks by other predators. The moral of the story here is that there's no way to trap an animal in a humane way. You know, doing so is objectively cruel and inhumane. Mm -hmm. And when you do it well, you could, or as well as you possibly can, it could still be days that an animal is trapped and found and and that makes it even worse than it is. Uh, I mean, it's hard to believe, but... It is very hard to believe. And you know, their standards still allow these animals to languish with potential broken bones and hemorrhaging for days. We've also received reports of still nursing moms who are desperate to get back to their pups, who have been known to even attempt attempt to chew off their own limbs to escape the trap to return to their young. And yet, you know, PETA exposed this through several reports last year, and in I believe in previous years too, the negotiations began, and there were even protests last year. Didn't it move Canada Goose an inch the right way, or did they just stay put? Well, we know that our efforts are being heard by Canada Goose. And our hope that is that behind the scenes, something is happening. We hope that they are genuinely considering making the ethical decision to stop using fur and instead use some of the very luxurious high-end faux furs. And instead of using down to stuff their jackets, they will instead use a high quality, high functioning synthetic material that in fact can outperform the down that they use because down becomes completely useless when it's wet. Whereas down alternatives retain that warmth and insulating capability, even when it's drenched in water. So we hope that our message is being heard and we hope that we hear soon that Canada Goose is moving in a dis, you know in the direction of being a more compassionate company. Well, as the senior director of corporate responsibility, you negotiate with them. Do they say anything back to you, like to indicate anything positive, or are they really just stonewalling at this point? Well, interestingly, they are one of the only companies out there who do stonewall PETA and uh. who refuse to open the door to any sort of conversation, which is one of the reasons that we have chosen them as a target. Because the momentum in the retail and outerwear sector is towards sustainability and towards more ethical sourcing practices. And then you have Canada Goose as an outlier. They refuse to engage. They refuse to admit that their practices are egregiously cruel. And they continue their business as usual while hiding behind these meaningless standards that effectively dupe and mislead compassionate consumers. And that's exactly the reason why after, even though some people are regular listeners of the podcast may say, hey, didn't you do something on Ken the Goose last year? Well, we did. We have to do it again because they haven't done much of anything to move things forward. So, I mean, and it's good to clarify that because I think, saw that instead of Fur Free Friday, PETA was going to have this Canada Goose protest uh, all throughout malls and in, in America. How successful were those protests this Fur Free Friday? Our protests were very successful. They were really well attended. We had compassionate people all over the nation attending the protests, talking to passers-by about fur in general and Canada Goose in particular, as well as not buying the down jacket, you know, in favor of a down alternative one. Um, but I would like to point out that over the last year, we have seen some progress by Canada Goose, but it mm -hmm. wasn't because they made the decision to be more ethical. It was because PETA filed a complaint with the F Federal Trade Commission and the Federal Trade Commission conducted an investigation surrounding Canada Goose's misleading claims. And as a result, Canada Goose stopped claiming that its standards, quote, ensure that suppliers don't abuse animals, 
Well, this is a kind of a marketing thing that companies like Kenda, Kenda Goose, they do these sort of tactics. They make it sound like they're better than they are. The lawsuit against Kenda Goose means that maybe you'll do lawsuits against others or have others been other companies been better than Kenda Goose in terms of coming forward to say, OK, you win, Peter, a little bit. We'll give you an inch here. We often file Federal Trade Commission complaints to try to get companies to stop making claims that really prey on compassionate consumers. So when a consumer walks into a store and sees a label that says responsibly produced or humane or ethical, they want to buy a product that is those things. And they're duped by those misleading marketing claims and they buy it even though mm. those products were produced um, in the same way that a conventional product would be produced. So the effect that Canada Goose's standards have on our efforts to get consumers to buy vegan is that well-intentioned consumers walk into a store, they want to feel good about what they buy, they read Canada Goose's claims, and then as a result, they're misled and deceived and they buy a product that was very cruelly produced. Which makes them more angry at the company. And then so maybe things might might fall Peter's way with one big effort this year, one big cold snap, you think? <laughs> well, we hope so. But I can guarantee you that we will not back down until Canada Goose stops using fur and stops using down. Now you mentioned down and I haven't really gotten into the down because we we're talking about the trapped animals. And by the way, those trapped animals and the fur, it's really just for the trim. It's just kind of decorative. It almost seems like a waste, right? I mean Canada Goose uses fur to right trim their jackets and it's used for decoration, you know, when people are walking down New York City in their Canada Goose fur trim jackets, clearly it's not protecting them against the elements. There is no reason to be wearing a fur garment, whether you're climbing Everest or you are walking the streets of Toronto. In fact, Colin O'Brady, who is the very first person to cross Antarctica unaided, which is like an over 900 mile trek and lasts 54 days, he wore a microfiber jacket with faux fur. So yeah. if he can do it in Antarctica unaided, then the general population can do it too. It's fashion and style and it's cruelty. That's what Canada Goose is. And, you know, we talked about the fur trim. Now let's get into the down because people who wear down jackets, they always say, come on, Emil. I Birds have feathers, they grow them back, they don't miss them. They Surely a company that uses down must have a humane way to get down, right? No? <laughs> no, not right. And this is my issue, because it seems to me that when people were complaining, you mentioned this earlier, that down when wet is not good down. Down when wet is even lower than down. Not good, not warm. And that there was something better and they came up with it. They came up with this fiber fill, whatever they call it. They put a, a, a brand name trademark on it and they started selling these totally vegan type of winter coats. And I saw them on the market for a while and down was nowhere. And just over the last, uh, you know, when I, I got the, the new catalogs for this winter season, suddenly, here are all these down uh, jackets and what happened? <laughs> well, I think if you look at the statistics, you'll find something vastly different than what you're finding in the catalogs. So if you look over the last five years at the U.S. feather and down imports, they've actually declined by almost a quarter. Mm. So could it be that the down lobby is like getting to some people saying, look, because this is what else I'm seeing. I'm seeing in catalogs people using the polyfiber fill, and instead of you know putting up these pristine vegan jackets up for sale, they're desecrating them with down. 
they're putting down in there and they're mixing them. It's almost like, mm-hmm. uh, you know, uh, the, the, if, if the fur trim wasn't bad enough on a Canada goose, it's even worse that they, they shun the fiber fill and put down. Well, I think the companies are just that are who, that are doing that are just out of touch. Um, mm-hmm. You know, consumers today want to buy products that really align with their values, and they like innovation. They like the newest thing, and so most companies are realizing that and are wanting to cater to that growing demand for sustainable and cruelty-free products. So they go and they innovate, or they partner with suppliers of down alternatives that do that for their full-time job, like companies like Prima Loft or Thinsulate or Thermor. Yeah, I, I see Prima Loft, I see it all the time. And, and they, you know, when the, the big Nanopuff jackets came out, um, some Nanopuff had, had down, but some had Prima Loft and it, there was always that option. And now I see, I, I, I almost see some of the catalogs maybe forgetting about the vegan option and moving moving more toward this oh we have this new and improved down now when they call anything down i guess it has to be down if they call it down or even if it's a trademark down like some kind of never never wet down trademark or whatever they call it you know you know what i mean when i say that mm-hmm. oh, but, but, by sure. the way it's it's okay to have your dogs chime in they're just cheering <laughs> you on I know. Thank you. I know that they're, they're just you know, it's but, it's but, my thirteen year old lab who is um deaf, so talk, to asking her to be quiet doesn't help. Well, <laughs> well, we'll put out a braille version for her. So, all right. So, tell me what happens when you know why do these companies do this with uh, by not maximizing on the primo loft and then going to you know using down. Well, they're doing two things. They're telling consumers that they're out of touch because consumers want the cruelty-free products or they want down and they're too out of touch. But rarely do people want this blend. But secondly, by doing the blend, they are putting off the consumers who do want the vegan products. So it's really not doing much for the company other than sending confusing messages. But I will say that the biggest outdoor retailers like the North Face and Patagonia are all marketing their down alternatives as being as good as down and in some cases even better. So in the case of the North Face, they have Thermoball, which has been around for several years now. And last year, they actually came out with their new Thermoball line that's 100% recycled materials. So every jacket that you buy is spun from at least five plastic bottles that would have otherwise ended up in a landfill. But they they market this product as not only being sustainable, but also as being as good as down and better in that it can still provide the warmth when it's wet. And Patagonia is doing the same thing with Plumafil, where they market it as replicating down. So the biggest outdoor retailers out there understand that innovation is the way of the future and that consumers love it and crave it and love to buy products that are the newest ones on the market and and being marketed as something that's premier to what they had in the past that used to be the best. Yeah, you know, I agree with you. I'm I'm for those uh, those those down replicators. And I I just have an, an Eddie Bauer guide here. I'm, I'm not trying to endorse anyone, but they have, but, but it's confusing because you see something called microtherm, right? And they call it microtherm down. And I'm saying to myself, well, is it down or is it synthetic? And it's trademark. So I'm wondering, it's got to be man made or is it? Is this one of those? And then they have another thing called down light outerwear. And it doesn't say specifically feathers, but it uses the word down. And once again, it's a kind of a confusing marketing move. But what does that tell you? I know your dog is upset by it. I'm clearly upset <laughs> by it. But what do you sure, think? Well, I mean, <laughs> it is confusing. <laughs> but I think what you need to do always is read the labels because marketing it can be confusing and often it's intentionally confusing. So the best thing you can do is read the fine print and find out 
exactly the components of the product you want to buy. And that's the only surefire way to know whether you are endorsing a cruel product or you're endorsing one that is cruelty free. But in, in this example, uh, first of Santa from Eddie Bauer, when they call it microtherm down, that's really confusing, right? That is very confusing. And I, I would guess that it is, in fact, down. Oh, so when they use down, it's down. But when they say something, when they call some, oh, when they say something is down light, that's down too. But, you know, I, I think that is the biggest, uh, you know, one of, one of the lies when you go through these things is, and I know a lot of people because it's cold, getting cold now throughout America, or it has been the last few weeks. You know, they're looking for something warm. They want they want to make make sure they're getting the warmest. But you're saying there are vegan alternatives that are as warm, if not warmer. Yes, I am saying that um, I gave the example of Thermoball by the North Face. It is the warmth equivalent to 600 fill goose down, which is going to keep you warm in any condition. And then, yes, it has that ad- bad added benefit of providing you warmth, even if you get it drenched in a river or in a snowstorm. Tell me when you're a a consumer out there and you're faced with all this and you get mad, do you just call up, do you you call up the CEO of the company or should they call PETA or the, what should they do if they're a consumer and they're, they're mad about this stuff? Well, they should definitely use their voice to speak up in any way possible. So complaining to store managers or calling the customer service line or calling the headquarters and asking to speak to the CEO. All of those send the message to companies that the demand is very high for cruelty-free goods. Um, It's also really important that consumers take the opportunity to educate their friends and family as to why they should leave something on the shelf if it has an animal-derived component to it. And, you know, that sounds good, but they they need some muscle. Shouldn't they call PETA, too, and get (laughs) be part of some kind of massive class action? (laughs) Well, we are happy to hear complaints, and a lot of times we do act on them. We learn so much from our supporters and letting us know what companies are up to, um, whether they're being misled. Whatever is happening out there in the marketplace, we want to know about it. So we definitely want people contacting us. But I will also tell you and all the supporters to rest assured that we are in contact with every major retailer out there. And we are urging them to support more cruelty-free products and practices. So, you know, we're, we're doing our work too, but we always welcome the help from supporters. Now, as the... Senior Director of Corporate Responsibility for PETA, that means you are in there negotiating. What are these negotiations like? Because ultimately, you know, you and I know that it's going to be the marketplace that decides. And if the marketplace pushes them in the right way, they're going to go the right way. But how compassionate are these people that you, you know, have to negotiate with? Yeah, that's a good question. So I think there's a spectrum. And on one side, it's consumer demand. And on the other side, it's corporate responsibility. And I think you're only going to see meaningful progress when you have support from both ends. So you need consumers really voicing their concerns about various products or their demand for cruelty-free ones. And you also need companies to be the responsible corporations that most of them claim to be and to really take action that align with their mission statements and with their stated objectives or milestones or benchmarks that they've set for themselves. And in today's market, most corporations are willing to have conversations about how they can do better and what they can do to really appeal to the compassionate consumer base, you know, now millennials and Gen Z as the largest consumer base in history. C- companies want to cater to them. So not only are they capitalizing on it financially, but they're doing better for animals. They are doing better for our planet by eliminating the animal agriculture footprint. So it's a win-win as long as they're open to the conversation. And I would say that most of them are. 
And are there some companies that are that you would say are better than others? And you're clearly targeting Canada Goose because they're not one of those companies. But are there some companies that are better than others? Absolutely. I think there are dozens and dozens of companies out there that are making progress, that are introducing more vegan options and eliminating some of the cruelest ones. You know, all of the major retailers out there need to do more though. I mean, we're mm. pleased with them taking steps, but we continue to push them to do more because when you are a massive retailer and you have thousands of different SKUs and thousands of different suppliers, there's going to be cruelty inherent in your supply chain. And so we just encourage companies to take steps to address it. And it might be one material at a time um, or one vegan collection at a time. But when you think about the scale of these companies, those small steps are huge when you consider the impact that it has on animals. And then what about just a company getting a call from PETA? That must mean <laughs> something. I mean, they don't want uh, an, an action alert and getting a, a million emails, right? <laughs> That's right. They try to avoid that. And we also try to avoid it. Our goal is always to work behind the scenes with companies and try to identify ways where we can play a consultant role and try to get them to move towards more compassionate products. So but you sometimes can, that doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but you can even get to the point where you say, well, you know, you have a perfectly vegan shoe and then you throw a little shade, a little suede on the heel and suddenly it's not vegan on a, you know, a hiking shoe. And, you know, it seems like some companies, well, they'll put out their vegan vegan products and then they'll keep the hardcore this is leather this is new buck which is not which is leather and not vegan or this is you know something else with a, a, a leather trim and so they they're playing both sides but <laughs> that's mm -hmm. kind of i mean there's this one shoe company that i i uh, patronize and i buy their vegan shoes but when they put out these leather shoes that i can't buy i feel a little like maybe I should look for another pure company. Is there any way, I mean, I guess that's a balance, right? That That's a corporate balance, right? They're being responsible on the one hand and being greedy and cruel on the other hand. Uh, is, that, <laughs> is that the best for some companies? Well, it's definitely a balance for consumers to try to figure out which companies to support and which to not support. But I would say that when companies have vegan options and you want to buy them, you should buy them because it sends the message to companies there that there is a demand for those products. And if they see that demand, they want to capitalize it and they'll grow those options. But you have to draw the line in the sand somewhere. And certainly you don't want to support a company like Canada Goose, where they're yeah. doing nothing to improve the lives of animals. Well, that's a, this year's campaign again. Uh, focused on can the goose uh, at some stage it's it's you got to admit it's a little like sisyphus pushing that rock up the hill it seems hard uh, you know you're waiting for that moment when things are going to you know break for you and maybe they'll say okay we'll take away half the half the fur trim or whatever but what keeps you going and keeps you motivated about your job, are there are there enough signs, the positive signs that say, "Hey, things are 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 going the right right direction for the animals." I feel that every day there are small victories that keep me going every single day, and then it's also trickled in their very big victories. So I stay motivated every day because I do see corporations doing the right thing and. That's what keeps me motivated. Um, we also work among other pe people at PETA who are very motivated and are so dedicated to the cause and to our mission that they go to work every day with their head held high, working very hard with the same goal in mind. Yeah, you know, also I know there's some personal origin stories that people have that keep them focused on the you know their eye on the prize as it were and i i was reading something that peter put out to the augustus club 
where you talked personally about how you came to animal rights and you talked about the uh, a bird you saw as a you had a you had a bird as a young girl you, was it a family pet mm-hmm. it was my pet and i was in what i thought an animal lover and we would go to the pet store and i could pick out any animal that i wanted and we'd bring the animal home and try to care for it in the best way we knew how of course in hindsight the animals were suffering and all eventually died quickly after I homed them. So yes, that's how I came, I think, to understand that whenever you are benefiting at an animal's expense, there will be tremendous suffering, even if you think you are well-intentioned. Well, what happened that there was a time when you were 10 years old? What happened that day that was this, you know, special memory? Sure. So we had brought a bird into our house and um, he was in the cage and I would leave the room and I would hear the bird flying back and forth in his tiny cage. And clearly the bird was in distress and I could hear it from the other rooms in the house. And I would go back into the room and then the bird would be completely still. And then I would shut the door and leave again. And I would hear that same smashing back and forth. The bird was flying from side to side, crashing into the wire sides of the cages. And one time when I re-entered the room, the bird had died, um, had hit himself on the cages so many times and was laying on the bottom of the cage dead. And there was blood splattered all around the cage. And I think it was then that I realized that I wasn't actually saving these animals, that if I really loved them, I wouldn't be holding them in cages. And it was then that I sort of adjusted my thinking and philosophy about animals, even though I was so young, you know, it took me a while on my journey to become vegan. Um, but eventually I got there. And I, I do think back to that day when I found the bird at the bottom of his cage. And I do think that was sort of a turning point in my life to realize that we have a responsibility to protect animals in any way that we can. And it can start as young as 10 or younger. Um, But as long as you get there and you realize that we all have ownership over our lives and we can make decisions and we vote with our dollars and we vote on these issues every single time we buy something or we put something in our mouths or buy a skincare product for our body or makeup for our eyes, we are voting with those decisions. So you think about that bird a lot? (sighs) I do every once in a while, you know, when, when we don't have a lot of victories to tout or you just kind of wonder, am I making a difference? And you think back to that one, that one scenario where it was just that one bird that I needed to help and I couldn't. And I think it helps you understand that you don't have to help all the animals in the world, even though you wish that that were possible. If you can just help one animal, then that's enough. And I guess if you can, well, if you don't, if a a person listening doesn't buy a can the goose jacket, how many animals do they help? (laughs) Well, they're helping a coyote. Um, I think if you go vegan, then you save over 200 animals a year. Um, So every time you shop, if you opt for that vegan clothing item or vegan meal, then you are helping a tremendous amount of animals cumulatively over your lifetime. Tell me about the standards. Why are the standards, they have, they set the bar high, which allows them to get away with a lot of these minor cruelties, which are really major tragedies to the animals. Tell me about the standards and why the standards are an issue. So Canada Goose has a history of claiming their products are somehow humane and ethical, and they tout various certification programs that sound somewhat legitimate. But when you pull back the veil, even just slightly, it becomes very clear that the claims are meaningless and that the coyotes used for the trim and the geese's feathers used inside the jackets, um, those animals still suffer in many of the same ways that they would, even if Canada Goose had no standards. And it really insults consumers' intelligence 
that Can de Goose attempts to convince us that fur and down can be produced humanely. And consumers rely on the truth in labels. And these marketing schemes really bet- betray the trust of the public and mislead these consumers into thinking that the products were more humanely produced than those produced conventionally. And there's a lot at stake these days. It's our health, it's the planet, workers' rights, and of course, animals. And each of us and every company really has a responsibility to align our actions with our values. And so every time you take out your wallet, you're voting, make sure to check labels. And if something is animal derived, leave it on the shelf and don't be duped by these marketing schemes. Where do the standards have to go? I mean, how to make an impact, do you have to say, what is the, is there a line that would be the clincher that would say, okay, now we have to do this. So we had a little loophole before, but now we have to do it this way. If their standards required that they only use vegan materials, they would be standards that consumers could rely on. There's no standard out there that will ensure the humane treatment of animals because There will always be loopholes, corners will always be cut, and no amount of auditing or company assurances can eliminate the suffering on farms that will happen when people aren't looking or when people just turn their back because they don't care enough. But it means that there's, if there's no absolutes, how do we know? How do we know that we're getting anything that is close to this vegan ideal that we want? Well, what is the vegan ideal is vegan materials. So check labels. And if you see an animal derived composition, don't buy it. When you say an animal derived composition, when you, you mean? So when you check the label on a garment, it will list what materials are used to produce it. So it might say cotton or wool or fur. So if it has anything listed that comes from an animal, you should recognize and understand that it was produced with animal suffering involved. And there's no way to get around that. On industrialized farm, in order to fulfill the demand in a commercial space, there will always be suffering. And there's nothing anyone can do about that. The only thing you can do is buy vegan products. That is the only way to ensure that you are not supporting cruel industries. Well, that's pretty plain. I mean, and you can't fight that. (laughs) You can't fight that going into a negotiation and say, hey, come on. Come on, guys. Give us some vegan products. (laughs) They won't do that. They, they they won't put that line in the contract saying vegan <laughs> materials, right? Well, I think companies that are ethical and are responsible are doing that, are creating vegan products and vegan collections and adding search filters to their website that indicates vegan products. So they're trying to make it easier on consumers because they realize the demand is there. So our work is to push companies to do more of that and to reduce with the goal of eventually eliminating all of their animal-derived products. Ann Brainerd, PETA Senior Director of Corporate Responsibility. She's the key negotiator with Canada Goose. In the conversation from December 2019, you heard... How he'd amounted another year exposing the cruelty of the company, those Ken the Goose products. And you heard Brainer talk about the fur, the feathers, and the importance of being feather free. And that's why, even though Ken the Goose has slowly approached becoming a more ethical company and has announced it's going fur free, Pete is announcing a moratorium on protests with the hopes that Ken the Goose will go further and faster for being a more ethical company. 
Go to PETA.org for more. our show for today thank you for listening and don't forget to send a link of the show to your friends hey tell them hey, you like the PETA podcast and they should listen to the PETA podcast you can contact us at PETA.org you can find me on Twitter at Emil Amok that's E-M-I-L-A-M-O-K or see my vlog at AMOK.com or see my work at ALDEF the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund that's at ALDEF.org slash blog Once again, thank you for listening. Check out all our episodes on your favorite podcast app or on Apple Podcasts, where you can rate and review the show. You know, it helps get the word out about the issues you care about. Our music is provided by Carbon Works. Check them out on YouTube. And join us again next time for more insight into animal rights and the fight for a cruelty-free world on The PETA Podcast. I'm Emil Guillermo. 